Hi everyone, thank you for, for having us. Um, yeah, I'm Nikki and um, Jane is my program manager and we're going to be um, talking about um, a whole lot of different things today. With It's such a big topic and we've tried to include um, a little bit of everything um, in this presentation. And we're going to be obviously talking about Quinn, um, our approach, the services we provide and, and how we support uh, people who use drugs. Um, we're going to be talking about what the experience is of our clients, what is the reality for them, um, do some myth busting around meth, um, explore different treatment options as the title says, you know, it's not just about uh, rehab and residential services. Um, and we're going to talk through some of the systemic barriers and what are the barriers for the people that um, we work with and um, Jane's, we're not just going to throw barriers out there, we're actually going to, um, you know, explore some solutions as well, hopefully. Um, and I think throughout um, the talk, we really want to try and present the real human, um, you know, the, the real um, life experience of, um, you know, what, what, what's the experience for our clients, the people that we support um, every day, and, and really reflect on not just the research, but our, our own experience as service providers. Um, cool. So, with that in mind... So Quinn stands for the Queensland Injectors Health Network. Um, our mission is to provide innovative health services addressing a range of drug related issues to illicit drug users and the wider community throughout Queensland. Um, so I think uh, one thing that sets Quinn apart is, um, you know, we have a strong connection to the community um, that, we, that we serve. We are run and managed by the community that we, we serve. We have a strong history um, as, as a peer-based organisation, so um, drug users supporting other drug users, um, and we really feel, um, you know, we really feel strongly about um, people's lived experience and, and the benefits that that, 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 that brings. Um, okay. So we are, for people who don't know Quinn, we have, we, we have different sites across Queensland. Um, our main office is in Brisbane, but we have sites at Southport, uh, Burley Heads, Townsville, Cairns, Maroochydore, and there are, there are um, our office sites. And we also do a fair amount of um, outreach work now um, from those different sites, so focusing on key areas like Redland Bay and the islands, um, you know, Metro North, so Caboolture and um, Redcliffe, and Met Metro South as well. So we, we've over the last couple of years, we've really expanded our, our outreach capacity, which has been great. Um, so, we provide a whole range of services to people who use illicit drugs. Um, we have harm reduction programs at most of our sites. So, we provide needle and syringe programs where we um, provide harm reduction education. So, it's about um, supporting people around safer injecting, safer drug use, um, minimising the, the risks around drug use. So, we might do education on overdose, bloodborne viruses, um, that kind of stuff. We do a lot of peer support in that capacity as well. Um, we have a medical clinic as well. So, we, um, you know, it's such a huge need for our clients and, and as has been touched on already, that the, the stigma for people who use drugs going to a, a general health service um, can, can be huge and people, our clients often won't go to, to hospital and health settings, so it's wonderful to have um, a medical capacity at, at Quinn. Um, and the, the other side of what we do is um, provide a, um, different treatment services. So um, for people who are wanting to make changes to their drug use, um, we can offer um, individual counselling. Um, you know, we do therapeutic groups, psychoeducational groups. We run um, we run for support for family members and, and loved ones of, of people who who use drugs. Um, and we do all that advocacy and education stuff as well across the organisation. So people generally come to us when they want to make changes to their drug use, particularly obviously the treatment team. People are coming in. Uh, looking at making changes to their drug use. Um, and we we do that in a number of ways. So we always work from a harm reduction perspective. Um, so we're always focusing on, on reducing the harms around someone's drug use. 
Um, we provide individual counselling. Um, all of our counselling is from um, a dual diagnosis perspective. All of the work that counsellors at Queen are dual diagnosis therapists. So, you know, that's um, really important that we're working with both um, the drug and alcohol issues and the mental health issues together. Um, and, and case management. So obviously not everyone who, who comes into Quinn wanting to make changes is um, wants counselling or is even um, in, in, you know, ready for counselling. So often there's a whole lot of presenting issues um, and so you know, it's being able to offer more generalist support, um, case management, um, you know, advocacy around, you know, it might be housing and homelessness, it might be um, legal issues, it might be general health stuff, um, you know, all of those issues that, that surround um, drug and alcohol use. Um, and we offer groups as well, so for people who are, you know, maybe a lot of our clients will, will uh, have counselling and also come to the groups as well, but some people um, just come to the groups and, and get something out of that, and there's a lot of love and support in the groups and um you know a lot of peer support and that's where the learning happens in 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 those groups it's really really great to see um okay so focusing on on dual diagnosis counseling so you know when addressing substance use we're always working um towards the client's goals they 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 come in and they tell us what they want to work on and we'll do our best to support them to get there you know um, some people want to stop using altogether, they just don't have the tools or resources uh, to do that. Um, some people want to reduce their drug use, um, some people want to reduce one drug but not another. Um, they may be happy with their levels of um, drug use of another substance. Um, and some people just want to know how to manage some of the harms and some of the impact around their drug use. Um, so it's, it's, we're working with whatever the client's goals are around their drug use. We have a really strong focus on mental health. Um, you know, as, as Jane will touch on later, many of our clients have sort of, you know, long histories of, of trauma, complex trauma, um, abuse, really, um, you know, really difficult childhoods and upbringings, which, is, um, which, which impacts on them. Um, grief and loss is um, a significant issue for our, for our client group. And parenting is, is quite a big one, you know, um, it's an issue that um, we, we deal with every day at Quinn, supporting um, our clients to be, to be better parents um, and to address some of the issues around their, their parenting and drug use. Um, yeah, and, and um, a really important part is being able to provide um, supports to family and friends of, of people who use drugs, as Tony, you know, highlighted yesterday, it can be really hard for, for family members and, and friends to, to know where to turn to get the right information and support. And it's really good to be able to provide that, that support to, to families as well. Um, yeah. So, next. I've already touched on case manage, but obvi obviously it's um, a part of what we do, care planning and coordination to, to you know, our, our population of clients. Um, you know, as I said, not all clients are ready for counselling or want counselling, so we're, we're exploring all those um, issues that come along with, with drug and alcohol use. Um, and just to give you a, a sort of brief idea of what, what the groups are about at Quinn, um, we have different groups. So we, we have psychoeducational groups where we're providing information, education and awareness around substance use and, and mental health. Um, and we also run some therapeutic groups as well, um, particularly around, around parenting and drug use. Um, so Mud Maps is an open group that runs, you know, on, ongoing throughout the year. And it's a good starter group for people. So people who are not sure if they want to make changes, you know, just want to come and, you know, it's a pretty open informal group. We talk about a different topic each week. It's a good sort of group for people who have never really engaged in, um, treatment of any sort before um, it just gives them a bit of a um, an insight and you know we there's a lot of support in the room um, it's not too intense um, and, and it is yeah it's it's a it's a really good group maze is a group that we run at various different sites across across the state focusing on mental health and illicit substance education and there's an eight week closed group um, so maze is about the interplay or the relationship between drug and alcohol and mental health um, 
and we have our significant other support. So we, as, as well as individual counselling for families and, and friends of people who use drugs, we um, run a group as well. Well, we do run groups throughout the year um, when we have um, you know significant numbers of family and friends who, who are requiring uh, more support. And um, Jane will touch on, on Treehouse um, on the next slide, but that's our parenting a parenting group that we run a 10 week, uh, a 10 week group. Um, so I'll hand over to Jane for a bit more info on that. Hi, um, yeah, just to go back to the SOS group, I think um, what we do realise with SOS, um, especially with families, uh, with adult kids, parents with adult kids that are using it, um, it's problematic is there's a lot of isolation, which I think was spoken about yesterday. And so bringing them together in a group can be really useful um, I think there's that kind of normalisation, there's a the validation and uh, just general support that people aren't getting through the community, through the kind of um, everyday community they're in. Okay, so I'm going to talk about Treehouse. So I loved our Treehouse parenting group. We've been running it for quite a few years now. Um, we don't always have the funding to run it as much often as we would like, um, but it's a 10 week um, therapeutic group. Um, and it's for clients who, parents have got uh, drug use and mental health concerns and we, the big basis is a non-judgmental and supportive aspect. Most of the people that come to Treehouse have um, either got their children in care or they've got children, um, or they've got the child safety kind of wanting them to do a parenting program to address their drug use. Um, so with the fact that a lot of the parents that come in um, either had the children removed or they've got that child safety involvement, a lot of what we first do is to really um, validate their experiences, um, you know, oft, often there was good reason for their children to be removed, but the trauma of that is so, is so big that it takes people a long time to recover from that in order to start actually moving forward. So what we find is the group amongst a, a group of parents in a similar situation really helps that progress. Um, they're able to offer each other support. We're also, what we're aiming for is for parents to take responsibility for their own part in what happened. It's uh, very easy to blame child safety and to blame other workers and other organisations or even um, ex-partners. And, and, you know, there is, we've got to validate that there's a huge power imbalance going on. But at the end of the day, um, we really want people to take responsibility so that they can actually then do something different. Um, if we can't get the taking responsibility for their part, then, it, then it's really, really slow progress. Um, but being in a group environment really supports that. Um, yeah. So we are looking to aim to increase the parents' ability to manage their drug use and mental health um, to provide a safer and rich environment where children and families thrive. We use the circle of security model a lot in what we're doing, so we're basing it on the circle of security. We're also talking about attachment. So we do go into um, how our parents were raised themselves, their childhood experiences. So we touch on some really difficult stuff in our group. Um, so we work very hard at getting a, a good cohesive group together with individual counselling as well, is what we really prefer. So people have got individual counselling and they're coming to group as well. Um, We've got a big strong focus on mindfulness as well. So what we're really recognising with our clients coming through with, with the parents is that they've got really often poor emotional regulation skills themselves. So we're looking at obviously, and it was always been mentioned before, unless you can actually emotionally regulate yourself, unless you can self-soothe, calm yourself down um, and actually understand what is happening for you as a parent, it's very difficult to do that for your children. I think we all experience that as parents sometimes. Um, but the parents that are coming through probably have a harder time doing it. Um, so we're looking really to, it's not, a, it's not about practical skills, it's really about um, improving the relationship between the parent and the child and increasing the parent's ability to actually understand what their children's emotional needs are and also then meet those emotional needs. So we ask quite a lot from our parents, but we, we do get really good um, results from this. So what we're aiming for, even if the child is not going to be returned um, fully to the parent, if re even if reunification is not happening, what we're doing is trying to actually increase the, um, the, the, the loveliness of the contact visits they're having. So if they're only having one contact visit a week or something, we really want that to be positive and, and what we learn in this group can really, really work on that. Okay, so clients that come to Quinn, 
So we're guessing it's around about 85% or more, that's a bit on the kind of um, safe side, have co-occurring um, AOD and mental health issues. The majority of our clients have a history of childhood abuse trauma, including physical, sexual, emotional abuse and neglect. So it's that complex trauma presentation that we're seeing uh, mainly that come through our doors. Um, yeah, they also have experienced insecure attachment as children, uh, leading to problematic relationships in adulthood. So we're seeing a lot of, um, you know, issues in, in forming relationships, maintaining relationships, um, partner relationships, children relationships, and, and also a lot of domestic violence coming through as well. Um, we have got higher rates, of, our clients have a higher rate of physical health issues, homelessness, financial difficulties, you know, criminal behaviour, incarceration, um, that high end mental health, that means a lot of them have had admission to the mental health um, secure, uh, units, and which often um, has been quite traumatic in itself. So, we, you know, the trauma just keeps building upon itself. So we start off with a, lot, a fair bit of trauma in childhood and then it just keeps on going. And unfortunately, um, having children removed, I think, really adds to that trauma and it takes a lot of getting over. Um, Self-harm, suicidality, so we're doing a lot of those assessments. We've also also started doing a lot of homicidal risks at the moment, uh, risk assessments, which isn't fun either, but we seem to have had an increase in that recently as well. So our clients have often experienced long-term loss of power and control. So obviously from the past trauma and abuse, the fact that they're drug users, um, there's a societal stigma and judgments um, around that and their mental health issues. So they get the double whammy here. Um, also their parents with this. So there's so much judgment and stigma. Um, they've had negative and alienating experiences with a range of services, including hospitals, schools, child protection, Centrelink, you know, the police and the prison system. So it's this, you know, just um, a lot of loss of power and control that's just carried on through their lives. So we're really wanting when they come in to see us to give, us a, to give them a different kind of experience as much as we can. Can everyone hear me at the back? Is that all right? Yeah. Good. Okay, so we did want to talk about non-problematic drug use. So often when clients come and see us at Quinn, they do have problematic drug use, otherwise they wouldn't be presenting in our service. But we do know that the majority of substance use is non-problematic. 41% um, of people in Australia have used an illicit drug. Um, I know this has all been spoken about, but I think it's good to, to zoom in on again. Uh, many people who use drugs do not become dependent or high risk users. So if we think of alcohol in that, in that way, that kind of puts it into perspective. Uh, people who use drugs have families and are part of your community. And as we said before, just because someone is using methamphetamine doesn't mean to say that they can't be good parents. It just needs that extra support sometimes and it depends on the level of drug use. So when does drug use become a problem for parents and children and drug and alcohol use? So it's really, we know all this, when there's no adult able to meet the child's physical and emotional needs. So if there is drug use going on and that's problematic, then you know as long as there's someone there able to care for the child at that time, then that goes a long way. When, when it's impacting on mental health to the degree that it, it really makes it very difficult to parent um, and impacts on relationship dynamics leading to conflict and aggression, and um, as Belinda said, you know, it's not causing the domestic violence, but it does, can influence that and make it, make it worse. And when uh, substance use becomes a priority over the family's needs. Okay, back to Nikki. <laughs> um, Cameron, uh, Cameron spoke a lot about um, methamphetamine yesterday. Um, so, you know, this has already been, this, this has all been said before, but I think just re reinforcing um, that again, um, you know, we know that not everyone wants to stop using um, methamphetamine. We, as Jane just said, not all methamphetamine use is, is um, high risk use or impacting on, on people's lives. Um, you know, it's definitely not the worst drug around. It's not an epidemic. It's, it's not more riskier or it's not riskier or, or more um, addictive, addictive than other substances. And there's no instant, you know, addiction. Um, 15% of, of people are at risk of, um, you know, on, ongoing issues. Um, so, so we know that 1% of Australians have used the drug in the past year. Um, most people don't experience any mental health issues or, or psychosis. 
Um, so 75% of people who use the substance don't. Um, I think, you know, it's not just about the substance, but looking at how the, the substance is, how, how meth is, is used um, and how we, how we really respond to it and address the needs of people who use methamphetamine. So the real lack of services, the, um, you know, having a good, we, we need a, a sort of a lot more diversity in services um, and, and more services. Um, and, you know, just um, really looking at those systemic issues in, in how uh, methamphetamine presents or how people who use methamphetamine present um, and it's already been said again but treatment for meth it's we know it's just as effective as for any other substance um, and most people do um, you know reach their treatment goals or, or recovery whatever that that looks like for the individual and it's very different for everyone so I was going to say this is a bit of fun but it's actually not really fun it's kind of some of the stuff that we, we're dealing with all the time um, you know Tony said yesterday we have an epidemic of media um, around methamphetamine and that that's really true and I think um, it really scares the community it scares people um, and this was from an article entitled um, imagine actually I'm looking to <laughs> tell the name of the article but if we just have a look over what it says and I want you guys to guess the guess the substance um, hey? Oh yeah, too good. Yeah. So this is um, from an article that's entitled, um, Imagine if the media covered alcohol like they co cover other substances. Um, so you know, some of the, you know, we really have to deal with some of the hysteria around methamphetamine use, um, you know, and that's one of the challenges that we're up against in the drug and alcohol sector is all the myths um, and misinformation around methamphetamine. Um, I just sort of wanted to wanted to highlight that a little bit. So, getting to some of the treatment options um, around um, substance use, a lot of our clients, um, you know, a lot of our clients come to us and they they say, "Look, I've been told I have to do rehab," um, and. You know, and it's already been said already, but that treatment is um, the only uh, the only option people think of in terms of treatment is residential rehab or detox. And uh, many of our clients aren't even aware that there are other treatment options. They've just been told to go and do a rehab, um, stop using, and, and get your life together. Um, so, so part of our role at Queen is really to explore what the individual's needs are around, around treatment for their drug of concern. Often rehab's, rehab's not an option for a lot of people because they have children, um, they don't have a lot of family support um, with their children. Um, they often have a home and there's con concerns around um, their, their housing whilst they're in a long-term residential facility. Um, often our clients don't even want or, or need um, a rehab service. Um, it's, not, it's often not an option for people who are in domestic violence relationships, abusive relationships. Um, pets can also be a big one for our client group. Um, people aren't going to leave um, their, their animals behind to, to attend a rehab. Um, so I guess just remembering that different approaches work um, for different people and at you know, all different times throughout their drug using experience. Um, you know, we've got ha wonderful harm reduction um, interventions and approaches. Brief interventions have been shown to be um, really su successful, particularly when working with people um, using methamphetamine. Um, we've got, you know, great outpatient drug and alcohol services, we've got count, you know, individual counselling, therapeutic and psychoeducational groups and great outreach services as well. So it's about trying to figure out what's the best, um, best intervention or best support for the individual. So um, harm reduction is um, 
an approach that can be that, that it doesn't have to be either abstinence or harm reduction. I think you can practice and you can provide information and education to, to, to people around harm reduction, even if they're working towards abstinence or, or no drug use in the future. It doesn't have to be an either or approach. I think some of the benefits of, of working from a harm reduction model are that it's strengths based, it's really client centered and client focused. Um, so you're, you know, you're focusing on real realistic, practical and, and achievable goals for the individual not just focusing on the on the drug use itself um, you're taking a real holistic approach as well um, looking at everything else that's going on for the for the person it's not about saving or rescuing um, the individual it's about um, you know that their human rights they're able to make choices for themselves around their drug use um, you know with the right education and support um, Okay, is this you, Janie? Yay, Jane's going to talk about brief interventions. So we know that a lot of people with methamphetamine use will only come in and get one or two sessions. I mean, and that's a lot what we see at Quinn. A lot of the time people will come in the once, the twice, and then maybe we don't see them again. So we need to make sure that this time we spend with them is spent really wisely. We don't want to spend the first two sessions collecting data, collecting uh, in the assessment process. I know that's important and we do need that for the longer term work, but I think it's really important to think, I may not see this client again, so I need to give them as much as I can in this, in this one session. So firstly, of, obviously the, um, the feeling they get from from meeting you and the organisation is the most important thing as to whether they will engage again in the future. So even if we don't see them again that time, they may come back in a year's time or two years time or six months time. So it's that um, the way that we respond to the clients, the therapeutic alliance from, from the beginning is really important. We can use it to um, give information and self-help materials um, so if they're thinking of stopping methamphetamine, then we need to give them information about what that's going to be like, what are the tips, what's going to happen, as much education as we can, harm reduction advice. Um, luckily at Quinn, I, I can just call on the guys from the NSP to come and support clients around their injecting drug use. So if I'm only going to see them once and they're injecting and they're having issues with their veins, then I'm going to pull one of the guys in to explain and support and look at the different options. Um, we can do some motivational interviewing to really work out what's going on, to look at the pros and cons of drug use. We all know just focusing on the cons isn't going to bring any results. Um, we need to look at the pros and why they're using. Um, we often use this time to link them in with a GP. Um, as Nikki said, we're really lucky at Quinn. We have two GPs in our Brisbane office and one GP in our Gold Coast office. So when people come in and see us, we can get them linked in with a GP. Um, it means they don't have to be sent to another organisation or another building. Um, uh, we, we, we think when that happens, we lose a lot of people. So we can get them linked in with the GP around their physical and their mental health needs and just start that process. Um, I was saying before, if we've got someone coming in that um, has just kind of decided to stop using, it's really useful, especially I was just saying on a Friday afternoon, someone comes in, they're feeling really unsafe. It can be really useful to link them in with a GP for um, a short prescription around some um, benzos or some, you know whatever to get them through the weekend. Um, we we also also need to assess for suicide at this stage as well. Um, okay, so brief interventions can be really really useful. Um, they can be really good in any situation, and I think sometimes we don't always give as much as we can in a brief intervention in in that initial one or two sessions. Okay, we do, we've moved towards an outreach model at Quinn because what we find is expecting our clients to get in to one centre and see us just doesn't work very well. Um, so we're trying to reduce those barriers. So the outreach model, we're basically looking at the assessment, support, case management and counselling. Um, and, and I think it's also about getting people to link in with their local community, accessing those supports and resources that are already there. Um, I think it increases the access for people and it also makes it the treatment and support service as flexible as, as we can. You know, we want people to engage. We don't want to make it difficult for them. Um, at Quinn also, we're lucky enough to offer um, appointments till seven o'clock in the evening as well, five days a week. And I think that really 
helps with this. We have a lot of um, people in the construction industry, workers that are coming to access our <coughs> services. And if we have those little later appointments, then that really helps as well. People with, ch um, with children, if they're waiting for someone to get home before they can come in for counselling, then that really helps. Um, I love working from, you know, we've got work from, so for example, we work from Mount Gravatt Community Centre. I love working uh, from there, seeing clients there. They can come in and see me, they can take a food parcel home, I can link them in with the local groups and what's available, it just works really well. Okay, back to Nikki. <laughs> So one of the really uh, great things about working at Quinn is that we have a really strong emphasis on peer support and um, people who use drugs supporting people who use drugs. Um, you know, it's um, I'm lucky enough to have a, have a bit of a dual role at Queen where I am um, I am a peer worker, um, and I think um, it's it's really important to link people in with um, others who have experienced uh, similar situations. Um, you know the 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 people that we work with they they have so much experience and education and, and, and knowledge and it's about you know peer support is really about people learning from each other um, and being able to support each other as well once they're away from the organization and it's really good to be able to facilitate that kind of learning and, and experience for people um, we know that the research shows how how effective and credible um, peer support and peer education is um, you know it's that that it, you know, it's, it's a credible source of support for people, often, um, you know, often our clients, um, you know, want to know if you, if you understand what's going on for them, if, if you have a lived experience yourself, um, so being able to reflect on that in your work with clients is, is really great. Um, I think it's all about social connection as well and not feeling so marginalised, so, so isolated, um, knowing that there's other people out there who have, have been through this and, and got through the other end um, or, or are still living it, managing it as best they can. Um, you know, sometimes it's, um, to some people, that there's more acceptance than, than going to a mainstream service. It can really be a good entry point, you know, linking in with peers can be a really good entry point into treatment services for a lot of people who just, you know, won't go to a mainstream service. Um, you know, there's benefits to the health system overall, you know, it really reduces um, the impact on, on the health and hospital system um, you know not just drug and alcohol use but mental health stuff as well it can really have a huge impact on people's mental health and you know we know that peer support it heightens people's self-esteem self-efficacy and uh, it improves people's quality of, of life overall um, yeah is that all I need to say about peer support um, so we're going to start looking at some of the, the barriers, uh, what, what some of our clients um, experience, some of the things that we see every day that just um, are really um, complex issues to, to work around and just keeping in mind that, you know, it's been said already over this last couple of days, but it's not people who use drugs that are broken, but it, it really is the system and services um, which often fail to address people's, people's needs. Um, so how can we as service providers and as a, as a system that, that works with people who use methamphetamine really, um, really have the best impact we can? Um, so stigma is, we, we know that stigma is probably the biggest barrier um, for people who use drugs. Um, you know, it's the most significant barrier to accessing treatment related services. People who inject drugs are a minority of the total population uh, of, of people who use drugs, but it's well documented that people who inject will experience um, the vast majority of, of harms, um, especially stigma and discrimination. Um, we know that the research shows that many people who inject drugs will regularly experience um, negative encounters um, with with the health and hospital system and, and with other community um, services and in the general community. And um, from our experience at Quinn, um, the, the level of stigma and judgment that, um, that our guys feel, um, um, it, you know, um, in, increases, um, increases their drug use, um, especially with parents, um, mothers who, who are using drugs. And, you know, I think um, we say that we want to support people who, who parents who are using substances, um, but often that can be 
really challenging in itself because people often fear fear linking in with services um, because of what might happen to them being a mother or a parent who is who is using substances. Um. <coughs> Okay, we're going to talk um, about specifically um, families and stigma. Um, so substance use during pregnancy and parenthood is an emotionally charged social problem in need of a compassionate and evidence-based solution. Um, so what we know what doesn't work is those punitive policies, um, lack of services impact, stigmatisation as Nikki's talked about, that often actually encourages drug use, um, it increases criminal activity, reincarceration and exasperates family and community health problems. So um, when we don't do it well, we know it has a real negative effect. Um, we know that women are scared for seeking medical treatment during their pregnancy. We touched on this yesterday. Um, especially a lot of people we've had parents coming through um, you know they were perhaps a you know part of the foster care system themselves as children they've already had children removed um, and being pregnant and, and wondering whether to access services is a real problem um, so if they come in and see us we're gonna have to work really really hard at persuading them that we can actually be of assistance and we're not going to cause more damage. Um, so we know that a lot of our parents don't attend the prenatal care that they need to. Um, it's a real barrier. Um, they often feel confused, vulnerable, and in some cases um, misled or betrayed by treatment professionals. And, and unfortunately, that's the reality. People will come in and see us um, with, with, in their view, you know, in their experience, tales of being really misled, of people really letting them down, never trusting people again, really, really difficult um, situations. Um, and as I said, that, you know, I think that's their experience of what's happened, and that's what we have to work with. So obviously fear of child safety interventions and removal um, can prevent that honest, open therapeutic relationship. Um, professional fatigue. A lot of our clients have been, especially if they've had children uh, removed or in that kind of process, they, they've been told they have to link into so many different organisations. Um, so previous experiences, lots of services involved, it can lead to real barrier to engagement. Um, to get to all those different appointments costs money. Um, it takes a fair level of organisation and if someone's mental health is not great at that time, it makes it really difficult. Um, hopelessness is a huge feeling of hopelessness around the child protection system and the parents you know it doesn't matter what I do they're going to screw me over you know it doesn't matter I'll jump through this hoop and I'll jump through that hoop and then nothing changes um, so we're often there trying to instill some kind of hope realistic hope that we can, working with us can make a difference and can change things Often our um, uh, people that come into our service have chronic health issues, again, which really impact on their ability to, to engage in services. Um, often family judgment as well. They're, they'll be the black sheep in the family or the person that's just been, you know, that lets everyone down. And, um, and that judgment from within the family is probably more damaging than anything else. So we're really trying to look at, look at that from a different perspective. Okay, so as I said before, um, removal of children is traumatic for parents and the children. Um, we're not saying that kids don't need to be removed, but we just need to remember that actually that removal is, is, is of trauma, a trauma to the parents that they need to kind of address before they can move forward. Um, when kids get removed, that's often when uh, substance use increases. Um, their, their structure, their lack of identity, that what am I meant to do, especially in those first few weeks, they don't often have much contact with their children. So that's often when, when drug use will increase and you know, there, there would be very difficult feelings to manage and why wouldn't you be using something to try and numb that out, especially if you're not seeing your kids. And, and in turn, mental health will usually get worse at this stage. Um, and it takes time to process this trauma and we can help that through doing the validation and the therapeutic support that I'm sure a lot of you do, that kind of real, yes, um, we've got to focus on, on the, the needs of the parent right there before we can focus on the needs of the children, that post removal. As I said, they feel they've lost their identity as parents and their role in life. And often because 
children and um, the adults we work with, the parents we work with, have um, experienced significant abuse and trauma in their childhood. If they don't know where their kids are, if they don't know the person their kids with, of course they're going to be terrified that someone is harming their child. And it doesn't matter if professionals say no, no, they're fine. You know, it, they're really scared for these kids. They're scared. How are they going to keep, be able to keep them safe? They, they've, you know, they, they had children. Often they've had children wanting to do something different for their children not to be harmed, not to be abused not to be traumatized and when they're removed that ability for them to, to take care of them is gone okay so also parents feel isolated um, which is where that peer support uh, the parenting programs and stuff can really help because they can feel that they're the only people in the world that, that have lost their children it's not something you can just raise to your average group of friends um, you know it's not something you can talk about. It's not something you can talk about with parents in school. It's, it's a really difficult situation. Um, there's the lack of trust with the services and work, workers, um, information sharing requirements, subpoenas. We all know that um, often all the files will be subpoenaed and what, what happens then? Um, so there's the limitations of confidentiality. Um, we're gonna talk about how we can handle this better. That's a huge barrier. Um, the emotional regulation skills and positive coping strategies to decrease substance use and to increase mental health just aren't there. So, well, not always not there, but often they're not there. And that's something we need to start addressing really quickly. Um, and also the parents' capacity to be able to sit in meetings to discuss their children, the removal, the concerns with um, with an organisation, with a worker, it's really difficult. So we really, we almost need to kind of get in there really quickly with that emotional regulation as much as we can to actually allow them to be in a relationship with the people that are making decisions about their children. Um, and the frustration and mistrust of the system. Yep, so drug using parents can be seen as bad, criminal, incapable of parenting. There's unfortunately still that moralising drug use, um, it's difficult to access services. Um, we know this. Um, the you know if you're struggling with um, transport issues, um, you've got mental health, you've got drug use to actually work out where to go, who to see, um, what's going to be useful is really difficult. And lack of family and community support. Uh, support. Okay, so we're on solutions. So this is going to clear everything up now, obviously. <laughs> So the most important thing, which you all know, is to focus on that therapeutic engagement between the worker and the client. Um, you know, we, we need lots and lots of empathy, lots and lots of respect, non-judgment. Uh, we need to know what our triggers are. We need to know what we feel about drug use, and we need to kind of manage to work with that before we put that on the, on the parents. We need to believe in the individual's capacity for change. Again, sounding really obvious, but we've got to believe it and then also communicate that to the person we're working with. We've got to, um, if possible, we, if, this is not short-term work. This is complexity. This is someone that's had complex trauma usually. Um, they've had years and years of struggling. Um, there's been so much, uh, I said, lack of power, loss of power control, a lot of <coughs> deep-seated stuff. It's not quick work. Um, luckily at Quinn, we can work with people for a uh, longer term. Um, and which is great and we love being able to do that. Uh, we, it's about seeing and valuing the person outside of the drug use. They're, just, they're not just a person that uses drugs, there's many, many other aspects to them. And also I think it's good to have that awareness of the impact of systemic disadvantage. We need to actually understand what it's like for our clients. Um, it's usually going to be quite different experiences to what we've had of living in the world. Um, so we need to try and learn from them what it's like for them and understand that. Um, awareness, as I said, as I said before, of need to grieve and process if removal has occurred. This is, this is really important. We need to be able to sit with this. It can feel as if we're sitting with it and we're not moving anywhere, but if we try and rush people through this or don't acknowledge it, it just gets in the way. We need parents to be able to access information early on about what services are available and how to access them with a choice of agencies where possible that they can work with. So what's going to fit for them? 
what do they, who do they want to engage with, as much um, choice around this. And also realistic expectations about what can be achieved in the time frame. Um, if we give parents too much to address, then they're just going to feel overwhelmed and that feeling of hopeless, hopelessness kicks in. Um, education for both workforce and management around the needs of parents with drug use. Um, and we wanted to decrease the stigma and to increase the confidence in working with this population. We come across many clients that come into our service that have been linked in um, sometimes with private practitioners and they said, okay, well, I'm doing that with them, but I've got to address my um, substance use with you. I personally don't think that that works that well. <laughs> we, we need to be able to have services that will deal with both um, and, and we need confidence in the ability to do this. It's, it's not, um, sure, we need, we need some information to do so, but it's not rocket science. It's, you know, it's, the two are so tied in together, we need to be able to do both. Um, accessible services, outreach or home visits. We can do some home visits at Quinn and I think that really works in some situations. There's certain people that will not be able to leave the home and we can work towards getting them to meet them as, to work in a community setting, but we might need to go in and do those home visits to start off with. As I said, longer hours of service really do help. Our, our late evening shifts, um, late afternoon evening shifts fill up really, really quickly. This is a tricky one. I was just winching to Cameron about this. It would be really good if our clients did attend every session and um, <laughs> that's not the reality. Um, so we want to be as flexible as we can with the fact that we've probably got wait lists. Um, you know, we need to be able to run this service and, and provide support to as many people as possible, but we've got to be flexible around people not being at able to attend every appointment and we need to work with them. What is going to be the best day to see you? What is going to be the best time to see you? Um, what you know because often people won't say that but if they're not attending their appointments what we're going to say is okay what's getting in the way what can we do differently that's going to make it easier for you to get in and see us do we need to meet you somewhere does it need to be a different day does it need to be a different time probably nine o'clock in the morning doesn't suit that many clients some of them love it but not all of them um, the, again this is a really difficult one and we probably have more changing changes in workers at Quinn that we would really like in the last six months but we know that when we keep swapping workers around it makes it very difficult for clients um, they need to build that trust and that attachment with you and when we keep changing that around it makes it very difficult um, the other thing that we always do when someone accesses counseling at Quinn I will, we will all say to them, we, you will be allocated a counsellor. Now, if that counsellor is not a good fit for you, you do not feel that you are working well with that counsellor, then you can come to us and we will try and give you another counsellor instead. And I think that's a really important message. Um, we're not a fee-paying service, but we've been providing money to work with these clients and not everyone is going to work with one counsellor. So I think the message there is really important. If you do not work well with this counsellor. This isn't just because it's your fault. It may be just not a good match for you at that moment. Um, and I think that really, really um, is a good way to start with uh, clients. And sometimes they do do that. And we've all experienced that idea of actually, no, I don't want to work with Jane. I want to work with someone else. And it hurts, but we're <laughs> able to move back through it. We need to be aware of other commitments. And uh, people might need assistance around scheduling and also working with other stakeholders to reduce appointments. We just, as I said before, uh, some with drug use, mental health issues, just having a full timetable without a day um, off, without you know this constant getting to and from appointments just doesn't work. Um, transportation is really expensive and it takes a long, long time. I don't know how many use public transport to get from one side of the city to the other. It takes a long time, it costs a lot of money. It, it's not easy. So we, if we can offer assistance with transportation, that's great. If we can't, then we just need to be aware of it and, and really factor that in. Um, a case management approach around, and also information sharing can be really useful, but we'll cover the limitations to confidentiality in a bit. It's got to be done within the parent's comfort zone. We need to be asking the parent very specifically, what information are you happy to share? What would that look like? How do you want to be told when we're sharing information? 
Okay, so here we go. Transparency with limitations to confidentiality. This is a really important part of our work. It's a very big rapport building. It's a very big important thing that we do at the beginning. Um, we need to be very clear about who we will speak to and who we will not. We need to be clear about material being subpoenaed. Um, I was working with a mum just the other day and she was saying she didn't realise that when she gave information about her um, a, abusive ex-partner and what was happening with the kids, that when the material was subpoenaed, then he would be able to read that. Um, it, it's difficult stuff, so we want to be as clear about it as possible and, and discuss it, what's going to happen, what would it look like. Um, we need to be creative around how we do that. So some of my parents will only be happy for me to share information if it's in writing and they get to read the letter first. And I think that's understandable. Why wouldn't they? So I'll often give them that letter to read. I can't lie about things, but I can look at, they can look at how I've worded it and see if they're happy with that. Um, we obviously need to do risk assessments around family safety. Just because we're not working with the kids doesn't mean to say that we're not focused on the children's safety. And we need to let our clients know what will happen if they give us certain information. We need them to be quite clear about the fact is, if they tell us certain information, what are we going to do that? What's the process? Is it just my decision? Does it need to be shared with the team? Will they be told? And this is something we need to keep going back to. It's not something you can just do at the beginning and then six months later, then just kind of, they, everyone forgets this bit. So we almost need a reminder about this. Be aware that case notes may be read by the client um, and ensure that you would be comfortable for comfortable for them to do so. This is a really good way to remember that what we're writing needs to be, even though it's you know difficult stuff, it needs to be done in a way that is respectful and non-judgmental and our clients would be able to read that and still remain in relationship with us. Um, we've got to be able to work with and recover from ruptures with clients. With people with complex trauma, um, I will have to have the conversation that I know at some stage I'm going to annoy them and they will not want to be seeing me for a while. I will do something. It doesn't matter what I do. Certain people, I will work really hard at, you know, at being in relationship with them. But something will happen and they will not want to see me. So I want to know with a client, if that happens, what are we going to do? Um, you know, if I've annoyed you, how will I know? Do you want me to call you? I don't want to stalk you. Do you want me to wait for you to call me? and then we can work through it. Do you want me to wait for a couple of weeks and then call you? What do you want me to do? So we're already anticipating this idea that I'm gonna do something that's gonna upset the client, they're not gonna be happy to talk to me for a while, what are we gonna do about it when it happens? And if we can do that, um, it's a really good healing work because if we can do that with, if they can do that with us, then they can then put that to different parts of their lives as well. Um, obviously, non-confrontational around drug use. Um, Nikki probably speaks better to, uh, with this than me, but yeah, we don't want to. Um, we don't want to confront. We don't want to push people into corners they can't get out of. We need to ex ensure we've got respect for their choices and their consequences. As Nikki said, people can make good choices. They just need information. We need to respect those. We need to be comfortable about discussing and reflecting upon drug use. It's, if we're scared of talking about this or we feel that it's not our area, then we're not going to get that ability to have this open and honest conversation around what's going on, which is really important when we've got parents that are using. Um, maintain the engagement. That is our big priority. Um, it's pretty basic stuff, I know, but if we, if, if, We've got a good therapeutic relationship with our client and we can keep them engaged, then we can, we can really work well. If we stuff that up, um, then nothing's going to happen. And again, seeing value in the person outside of the drug use issues. Okay, over to Nikki. We just thought we'd include some um, quotes. Um, these quotes are taken from the Family Inclusion Network report from 2011. Um, which were consultations held with um, parents uh, across Brisbane, um, and just just to re just to highlight um, what what parents um, want when dealing with with the system. Um, so the first quote says, "Support needs to be in place from the moment you are told your children are going to be taken." Um, I believe if I had more support, I wouldn't have acted out so much um, anger and hostility to the to the department. 
Um, so yeah, I mean, support needs to be in place, you know, preferably long before um, children are taken. You want to be doing all that work with parents um, beforehand. Um, but I think a lot of the um, issues, the, the anger and hostility that's uh, mentioned there um, can really be, um, can be minimised as much as possible if people understand what's going on, why, what's going to happen next, really um, being really clear um, with them. The next quote really, you know, they talked to me but I was too upset to understand. My rights were quoted straight out of the Child Protection Act with no explanation. Um, so it's not just about telling people what their rights are, but really checking that they that they understand um, <coughs> those. You you know, you know, when working with parents, it can be they, they you know experiencing that trauma of having having children removed and interventions with with child safety. Um, people just want to people just want to run away and don't, don't want to know about it. Um, so that. You know that relationship, that that rapport, um, helping people to understand the process and the system is is super important. Um, a positive quote um, at the end is: "I was asked what I thought and felt, and I was able to say what I thought." Um, you know, it's it's it, you know, parents um, have feelings and emotions throughout this process. Um, and, and they need to be heard um, and you know we need to be okay with them showing us um, those emotions and feelings and, and having a sp space to talk about it and debrief about what's going on. <clears throat> okay so overall to summarize what do we what do service users what do people who use drugs and their families want from us from services from the system um, we know through talking to people um, that um, the people that the people want information, engagement, and choice. They want increased access and flexible access, access, flexible service delivery. Looking at new and different ways of doing things to best meet people's needs. They want consistency in staff services in staff services and settings. Um, you know, trust is a massive issue for parents involved um, in the system. Um, and you know the less people have to tell their stories and, and relive that trauma the better that relationship is, is crucial um, they want positive approaches and attitudes um, they want proactive engagement um, they want you to reach out to them um, they want um, improved and client friendly systems they want to be involved engaged and informed um, so as much as possible involving um, service users in your service um, is a really effective way and a way of knowing um, that you're being responsive to, to the client group you're supporting. Um, a holistic approach, so people don't just want to talk about their drug use all day long and people want to be recognised as individuals and, and what else is going on in their lives. They really want staff who um, you know, care about them, don't judge, and but believe in them, and believe in um, a non-punitive harm reduction framework, a real client-centered framework, um, and um, yeah, to connect it, updated, and trained, trained staff. Um, so they're just a few things. <laughs> um, so our golden nutshell, I think, you know. Some, you know, really understanding the client's perspective is crucial. So getting parents with substance use issues involved in, in, in the system and in system reform, um, right from that low level stuff to, to asking them what their experience was, um, engaging them in feedback responses, but also, um, you know, having representatives from, from the community and from your client group to sit in forums, in, in committees, in meetings. Um, you know, treating them as equals through through the process and really learning from from their experience to inform to inform service development and and delivery. Um, I've already done the next one. Yeah, accessing client client feedback and client experiences to inform the way your service develops, and really working in a in a in a truly collaborative way with clients. You know, um, they're part of the team. They're, they're, you know, they're, they're the reason why, why we're doing the work and we want to know how we can best meet, meet their needs and the only way we're going to do that is really um, collaborating with them and then being actively involved in the process and as Jane really highlighted, um, you know, 
talking to them every step of the way, being open and honest, transparent, um, you know, yeah, is, is, is absolutely vital, especially when dealing with, um, with systems. Um, yeah, anything else? I think that's it from us. <laughs> Thank you for having us.